Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Frank Emmert. I'm an international business lawyer and arbitrator. And I want to talk to you about smart contracts, the legality, validity, and enforceability. This is our agenda. I will introduce three sets of three different problems. We're going to look at contract formation, performance of contracts, and enforcement problems. And of course, we're going to look at solutions to these problems. So three times three is nine. What does it mean? We have relations between the seller, the buyer, and the platform. Three parties that gives us three binary relationships. You can have issues between the seller and the platform, between the seller and the buyer, and between the buyer and the platform. What are these problems going to be? could be in the formation stage of the contract, in the performance stage, or after the contract has been implemented in the enforcement stage. Let's talk about contract formation first. As you all know, smart contracts are programs. They do certain things if certain conditions are fulfilled. The performance is very easy if it is instant. For example, if we do a funds transfer, if I have a digital wallet, you have a digital wallet, I can transfer money to you in exchange for a cup of coffee that I've just bought from you. That's easy and it's done. And of course, if you don't give me the coffee, the smart contract doesn't execute, you don't get the money. But what about if the contract is a little bit more complicated? What about issues that still have to happen afterwards? For example, if we buy or sell a machine and the machine is supposed to perform in certain ways or you give a warranty on your machine of a year or five years and it breaks down during the warranty. The smart contract is not going to solve that problem. Remember, promises are just nice thoughts if they're internal. If I promise to myself that I'm finally going to stop smoking, it's just a good idea, right? If I promise my wife that I'm just going to stop smoking now, it's a promise, but it's still not enforceable. If I promise my employer that I'm going to stop smoking in exchange for a discount on my health plan, then it becomes a contract and the question becomes, can it be enforced? What you have to remember is it doesn't really matter in most cases whether contracts are written down. The example when you go and buy a coffee here, there is no written contract. It also doesn't matter necessarily whether they're made face to face. We can contract nowadays very easily through the internet, through other forms of communication. And it doesn't even matter whether there's an actual exchange of money going on. What really matters is, first of all, we have to know the identity of the contracting parties. If you don't know who you're talking to on the other side, how are you going to enforce your contract? Secondly, we have to know that the other side has the capacity to make that contract. For example, that they actually own what they're selling to you or that they have the right to represent the company that they claim to be speaking for. We also need to know that the subject itself can be lawfully contracted. Not everything can be bought and sold in every country. I cannot sell alcohol in Saudi Arabia legally, for example. And finally, we need to know that parties actually want to enter into a binding agreement that can be enforced if necessary. Under the law, and this is basically the same whether you're national or international, we enjoy great freedom during contract formation. So individuals can bind themselves to all kinds of things that may or may not be very favorable for them. We have some limitations, for example, if some parties, minors, cannot make certain types of contracts if it involves large amounts of money, or we have protection for consumers, maybe for employees. For commercial contracts, however, business to business, there are very few limitations. If you're not contracting something illegal like chemical weapons, you can pretty much promise whatever you want and be bound and held to it. So, to answer the first question, legality and validity of smart contracts, we can really say that almost all smart contracts are actually legally valid because we have that freedom to enter into these kind of contracts. 
Nobody says you can't make a contract online or electronically or with another business party that you want to. But that's not the end of the story, right? Because with great freedom, as Spider-Man already told us, comes great responsibility. So what are the problems during contract formation? Contracts are that are not just intended to transfer money, but that need some conditions, some details, they cannot be easily coded on the blockchain. I'll give you some examples. For example, well, I can code the quantity and maybe the price of the goods, but how about certain qualities? Let's say I'm selling a bottling machine and it's supposed to fill 1,500 bottles of water every hour, right? But now it only does 1,200, maybe 1,300 on a good day. How do you do that on the blockchain? How about warranties? How about limitations of liability? How about payment terms that are not instant? How about which law should be applicable to the contract if there is a dispute? And which forum would have to be used for the settlement of a dispute? If these things are not well crafted, unfortunately, a lot of things can go wrong and parties may end up with an agreement that's binding but it's not what they had expected to enter into. So let's look at some additional performance issues here. During the performance of the contract, well, the smart contract takes care of the basics. Seller doesn't deliver, buyer doesn't pay, program doesn't execute. Hey, wow, that's great, right? We cut out the lawyers. That's what we want to do. But there are other problems that are not going away. What happens if the goods don't perform or they break down after delivery? Or what if it's involving more complex transactions? Well, licensing of intellectual property with the sale of the machine, shipping and insurance obligations, after sales services, we promise to train the operators in the factory that is buying the machine. And then we have a completely new set of problems that is being added by the smart contracts themselves, namely the relationship with the platform provider. What happens if the programmer made a mistake in the code? So the program executes in a way it wasn't supposed to. What happens if the provider of the platform gets hacked and the money that was uploaded and locked in the contract is suddenly disappearing? Where are you going to go? Then you need a really good contract in addition to what is coded into the smart contract. So let's talk about enforcement. Smart contracts need enforcement options that work. We are hoping that this will be rarely needed, right? Because the programs should only execute if everything goes well. So we assume that there will be less need for enforcement and that's awesome. Less need for enforcement cuts out expenses, cuts out middlemen, and makes programs and contracting more efficient. But if you need enforcement options, then you really need it. And you're not going to count on luck, right? Because luck is not a very good business strategy. So unless validly agreed otherwise, enforcement is done via the public courts. Now, if you are based in the United Kingdom, you're spoiled because your courts here they are known to be fair and efficient, and the decision's enforceable. That's not necessarily the case in, the, in a lot of other countries around the world. And I don't have to go to you know, failed states like Somalia or Afghanistan for these kind of problems. I just go to Italy. My lawyer colleagues in Italy assure me that any half decent lawyer can block a case in the courts for at least 10 years. That's not fun if you're trying to get your money back. Which law is going to apply to your contract? Is it seller's law? Is it buyer's law? Some neutral third country law? Which court has jurisdiction? Seller's court? Defendant court? Do you really want to have a first round of litigation over the applicable law and the, the applicable forum? What about delays? What about bias against foreign parties? What about incompetence, let alone corruption in courts in quite a few countries around the world, I can assure you. 
Now add the blockchain technology when you're talking to judges who are still trying to figure out how to use their desktop computer. So you need actual solutions. Before blockchain, making a contract was always quite easy. Making a good contract, that was more difficult. Now we are learning very rapidly that making a contract with blockchain is easier than ever. But I assure you, making a good contract is also becoming more difficult than before. So how do we see what really smart contracts on the blockchain are going to be? Well, we all want to cut out the banks and the lawyers and the middlemen, but we still need contracts that work and that deliver and can be enforced if necessary. Thus, we have to develop new rules how to form good and enforceable contracts and comprehensible templates. That's what we are providing, templates, model contracts that you can use for more or less standardized or repetitive transactions that are vetted by our law firms, partners in different countries, that are good to go, that are enforceable if necessary, and they are free with the use of our system and translated in all kinds of languages, so you don't have to second guess what that Spanish language contract really says that you're just signing. In addition, we need procedures for enforcement, not with the courts, but with arbitrators who understand the business, understand smart contracts, and they can deliver fast, affordable, and enforceable decisions. Now, if I go, there are plenty of arbitrators out there. We work with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators here in London, top rate, first rate quality, but they're very expensive. They will tell you quite frankly that if your dispute is not at least 100,000 pounds, it's not worth it taking it to arbitration. Well, we have solutions that we can scale down to enforcement of contracts that are no more than five to 10,000 pounds. And that's when it gets really interesting. So let's work together and build this foundation and walk the next blocks together. <coughs> because we have to acknowledge that it takes a lot more than a good programmer to make a really smart contract. So this company, PrepayWay, offers smart contracts for real estate transactions. That's what our initial business was about. We are expanding into all kinds of international business transactions and we realize that we need dispute settlement procedures that nobody else is providing. So we founded the International Smart Mediation and Arbitration Institute in the United States. So what we are offering is legal agreements translated into different languages and checked for different jurisdictions. We convert them into smart contracts, we have the funds transactions, and we have the dispute settlement procedure. Nobody else offers you the same comprehensive package. So, smart arbitration is not an in-house project. We don't want to only serve our own needs, but we are offering this for everyone. You can check us out. We have model clauses to be integrated into your contract so that you can call on our arbitration and mediation services. Even existing disputes where good dispute settlement provisions were not included in the past can be submitted to this arbitration procedure. So let's work together, learn from each other and develop dispute settlement procedures that work for all contracts on the blockchain. Thank you so much.